Hello and welcome. Well, COVID-19, for all the benefits in having life slow down a little and enjoy being home more, has in fact increased um, many children's addiction to playing online games. And if you're a parent that have concerns about the effects gaming has on your children during this time of isolation, then you're definitely in the right place. And today we are thrilled to speak with Andre Castello, AC, um, and otherwise known as Dad the Gamer. And whilst a podiatrist by profession, AC has a real, uh, real passion for gaming. Now, as a father, what has become apparent to him over the last several years with the likes of Fortnite and so many different gaming platforms is just how many parents are worried about the nature of gaming and what it means for their children. So AC's mission is to empower parents by demystifying gaming. Thanks so much for your time today. How are you doing? I'm well, Rage. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, pumped. Welcome. Really well, thank you. How about you? You're good. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, as, as we we're just saying, I'm really, really excited to be chatting with you again and welcome back. Um, and this is something that, as we were just talking about, no doubt is um, of, of concern to many parents at the moment. And of course, the reality that we're living in at the moment is a little like that of a, <laughs> a virtual reality computer game, just minor zombies and I guess other mythical creatures amongst many others. <laughs> But um, these last few months has really meant, I guess, kids haven't had their usual commitments or distractions, that being the likes of hobbies and visiting, um, socialising and and being out and about, you know, and aside from their schoolwork and household chores, kids have had a lot of time um, available to play games and stream and and socialise with their online community. So just initially, I'd love to know what's your opinion on the impact this has had uh, on children in general? Look, I think it can go both ways. Um, You know, there's been plenty of research looking at the validity um, of friendships that are formed online. So we're social beings, so human beings like human contact. That's part of, of what we what we do. And and you, we, even within that group, we have introverts who, who maybe don't like that face to face contact as much. And um, if I just take a step back, there's been a lot of work around gaming addiction and and um, gaming dependency. And uh, for example, the World Health Organization did a lot of work and was working around a, a significant boatload of work around that late last year okay but with the advent of COVID they actually took that away because they saw the benefit of online relationships filling the void of not being able to have social interaction in a face-to-face sense was greater so they saw that the, the negative effect on mental health by not having social interactions with anybody was going to be greater than the potential for you know gaming addiction by kids playing online games so With COVID, with the lack of face-to-face, with the lack of soccer or sports or performing arts or whatever, um, this has provided opportunity, gaming has provided an opportunity for children to form friendships or maintain friendships online, which potentially they wouldn't have had face-to-face. So that's a positive. However, like anything, there's two sides to each story and there will be cases of children who... Um, for whatever reason, have now been allowed to go carte blanche on games and just without any kind of um, supervision, if you like. And, yeah, they may have gone too far the other way and have actually, to the detriment of any social kind of interaction, become almost addicted to gaming. And that's always a fine line I think we walk when we talk about gaming is what is too much, what is too little, how is it helpful and how is it detrimental. So for me, it's, um, I've seen cases where it's been very, very positive but on the flip side, I've seen sides where it's, it's been quite negative. So um, I think it depends on the child, the family and the situation. A hundred percent. That's really fascinating that the, um, the, the world um, the who have almost, almost underlyingly sort of supported the, uh, the exposure um, to online gaming for the sake of that social connectedness, I guess, right. for kids. But I guess, you know, being socially isolated from their pit, peer groups has meant that many um, online gaming um, has, has been sort of their children's main um, social out- outlet aside from their family, as you just said, and kids have become accustomed to chatting and playing with their kids online. And no doubt, I guess this socializing has been, you know, really beneficial for their mental health to stay in touch. So from a mental health perspective, I'd just like to know what your thoughts are on that. 
Well, look, I, I mean, again, I'm not trained in mental health and obviously I have conversations with friends of mine and peers and colleagues and um, there is a lot of work going into psychology around gaming and, and, and gaming addiction. So, you know, obviously in my role, I kind of, I have to be across it and I really read and, and do a lot of um, work in that space. Um, I, look, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that that personal interaction, that interaction, all you need to do is jump in a game and with kids when they're talking with their friends and their peers and the laughter and the positive impact that it yep. has on them, yep. there's no doubt that there is some positivity to it. Yes. Um, you know, and, I, and it's just anecdotally, looking at my daughter who's you know, 11, um, she was really struggling um, with COVID. She's a social being. She likes being outside. Yep. Um, she likes doing arts. Um, but, you know, a little bit of Animal Crossing, um, working with their friends to do little jobs on the island or jumping into Fortnite, playing with her brother and some friends. She kind of lifted, and she kind of a little bit more positive, that happy laughter was there, okay? So, you know, both anecdotally and from what we're, we're seeing on the outside, there are some real positives. But like anything, it has to be tempered because it can go to that dark place where all they want to do is that. Um, and I always I say, I'm not... I'm not arguing that all I want the children to do is play games or that's the only thing they should be doing. Um, definitely not. It, it's, it, they've got to have that balance. Yes. Um, and to that end, you know, we have seen it where it goes into that dark place and that's something that obviously we need to, as parents, be conscious of um, and, and yeah. you know, manage. That being said, we published your article and the title is Dealing with a Gamer Post-COVID. So for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please tell us what it's about and uh, just what inspired you to write it? Okay, so the inspiration is simple. Um, it's Master 13, my son. Um, I think <laughs> what we have is some kids, um, and my son, he's a great kid. He gets on well with people, but he is an introvert and he does love gaming and you know, he loves everything associated with that. So for him, lockdown was Nirvana. Um, and I guess, you know, the ability to play games and, and socialise online. And I guess what we've seen, and, and, and again, as coming out of COVID, it's hard for children to kind of, come away from something that they're really loving and passionate about and happy about and how we kind of manifest that transition back into normal life. And I, I used in the article about like us coming from a tropical holiday and coming back to the, to the, you know, you know from I quote this later on actually to the state of winter and going back to work and how do we transition? And I think the, for me, it was how do we help that our child transition from gaming and, and what is effectively their nirvana back to what is real life, which is going to school, going to soccer, going to their sports and outlets. And um, I think what I wanted to do was, you know, shed an, uh, a light on that for parents and kind of help them manage that little transition away from A to B. Awesome. Now, starting from the very beginning, by definition, what is a gamer? All right. So this is the most, this is a really fascinating thing. So um, once upon a time, gaming was just someone who played games. So it was right back when it was people who played games. So when I was a kid, you know, those people that used to, the, the nerdy kids at school that used to go and play Dungeons and Dragons and those kind of things, that was considered a, a game. It was all board games. And then it transitioned to people who played consoles or online or whatever. Um, but that term has kind of evolved even further now uh, into subsets. And so now you have, you know, as many as, I think it's off the top of my head, six or eight different subsets of games. I'm going to bring this um, up in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'm um, sorry about that, but yeah, I'm doing, get, you know, jumping out in front and, and going from there. But um, yeah, so a gamer is the colloquial term given to somebody who spends a, a proportion of their time either watching or playing something on a screen. So be it mobile, PC or, or console. Cool. So that being said, you mentioned in the article that New Zoo, a company who does market analysis of games, has done some research and have begun segmenting gamers into six different distinct groups. Um, and they have gone a step further and have actually developed a quiz which parents can help determine which of the six types of gamers their child actually is. So can you maybe just tell us a little bit more um, like why they, they've actually done this? Well, I think it's really important to understand that people consume gaming content in different ways, okay? So, um, you know, one of the, the gamers I talked to, in, and this is my, my master at 13, he's one of these, <laughs> he's an ultimate gamer, 
everything is about gaming from, you know, what he reads on Reddit or, or, or you know, he's, on the internet he's reading articles about games or he's, if, if he's not reading, he might be watching YouTube and watching people play games or he's in there playing and he plays competitively. Um, so someone like that is very into the game. But then you've got people that, prefer, I love it, it's called like a popcorn gamer. So a popcorn gamer is someone who you imagine sitting and eating popcorn consuming gaming content just by watching it. And people say, well, why would you want to watch it? I think it's no different than watching reality TV and watching somebody play it. And I think it's important, this, this, this distinction of diversification, because a popcorn gamer, for example, if we're talking about coming out of COVID, someone who watches it, it's very, it, it would be easier for them to transition back in because on the bus to and from school they can watch or, you know, it's like watching TV. Um, whereas, you know, an ultimate gamer is someone who, like my son, it's their nirvana. They want to be doing it all the time. So that person may find it a little bit harder to transition away from gaming. So the idea being that if you kind of knew what type of gamer your child was, then that would give you some control and power and understanding about what it's like when they're transitioning out of. So if, you know, my Master Eleven's more of a, she's not a popcorn gamer, she's a casual gamer. She'll pick up, she'll play for a couple of hours over a course of a day and then disappear. That person, that child may be finding it much easier to get back into um, life post COVID than someone who say, it's all about gaming. And as I said, they're in their little gaming, um, Nirvana heaven and, and playing everything that they want to do. So I think that's just really it. Um, and, and, and so there's six different levels, isn't about, there? There's six yeah, different levels. Like some people are really into it and some people just aren't. You know, I'm, a, I'm what they call a cloud gamer. Like I like playing, I like playing by myself. I don't generally like playing with others. Um, that's not how I am in real life, but just when I'm playing computer games, I like to play by myself um, and I can switch it on and leave quite happily. So I'm not an overly addicted gamer and, and I can come and go as I please. Um, you know, so it's, it's really about segmenting it and where they are on the scale and then how do you as a parent navigate that? And, and I go to say this even in the article that um, we have husbands and wives who are gamer girls or gamer dads or whoever doing this little quiz with them it gives you an understanding of potentially what they're like, especially if it's not something that you're into. Like my wife isn't into gaming at all. So having an understanding of, for example, what my son's like um, helps her understand him a little bit better and then well, it helps with transition and managing moving on from there. Well, that being said, what information have you found the quiz actually provides parents with? Is it just a better understanding um, where their child sits on the gaming spectrum and how important gaming actually is to them? Is that right? Yeah, and, and, and where they get that joy from gaming, okay? So I think that's really what it is. And, and look, it goes quite deep. Um, you run the, and it'll tell you a whole range of things around what a, a popcorn gamer is or what an ultimate gamer is or, you know, some of the other hardware enthusiasts, you know, the kid that wants to go out and get the best of everything, wants to get the newest headphones and have the, the newest console. And he's, he or she may not play all the time, but they want to have the best. Yes. So, you know, when they're Christmas presents, you know, that's what they want. Um, or, as I said, the cloud gamer like me or the mobile gamer, the person who only plays games on their mobile phone. So, you know, the one that disappears and goes to the toilet and spends 40 minutes there and you don't know where they are and they're lost doing something on their mobile phone. So it's really about um, under, helping us understand the individual. And I, I'm really big on that, I think. Understanding is the key. Well, and as you just mentioned, so the quiz helped your wife uh, understand your son a little bit more. How has the quiz um, information helped you personally as well? What did you sort of get out of it? Well, I mean, for me, when I look at my son, I mean, I've had inklings, but, you know, I just didn't really kind of take into account just how much of a gamer he actually was. So, you know, there's this notion that he plays games, he's on the console, so that's the only time he's gaming. But it's actually not like that. If he's reading phone, he's reading Reddit about, you know, strategies in a particular game or who the top five earners are or whatever. Or mm -hmm. if he's watching, he jumps online and watches um, Overwatch competition, competitive play, the Overwatch League. So it's actually much more than just him on a game. It's yes. how that encompasses his whole life. And for him shaping his career, he actually wants a career in gaming. And I think, you know, we kind of think, oh, he's just playing, but... Um, you know, my son, 
you know, with streaming and he's kind to try to develop, a, he did a lot of this during COVID, trying to develop a following online and become an affiliate with a streaming service. So this is for him much more than just escapism. This is him investing time and effort into something that he wants to make a career out of. So when you've got somebody who is exactly. out there doing moment. something to invest in the career, I think you view it a little bit differently. You know, if my son's out there hitting a tennis ball all the time to be the best tennis player in the world, I'm happy to accept that. But if he's out there putting time and effort into growing an online following because he wants to create a career in gaming, mm. that's very different than I'm addicted to games and I just have to play all the well, time. And I think that that's a subtle difference, but I think, you know, a powerful one. Very, very much so. So talking about then the kids that maybe aren't at the, the level of the ultimate gamer like your son is, um, I'd love to know, you know, what are the side effects on children um, that maybe are sort of some of the levels below that, that they are, I guess, starting to take gaming very seriously and have maybe slightly become addicted to it whilst they're home in isolation. Um, what are your thoughts yeah, on, on that? I think mean, that's there's definitely an element of that you know things like mood swings tantrums you know that whole thing of um you know look the big thing with a lot of games game developers aren't silly they've created a lot of um reward systems that kind of fire off the dopamine in the head so oh, it's kind that was of my like next question <laughs> but, but that's really what it is it's like a yeah. it's like Ding, 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 flashing lights dopamine receptors i've got to get to the next point i've got to get to the next point yes so i get a reward and they're very, very clever about how they do that, okay? And I think that's the kind of stuff where kids kind of get sucked in because they don't have the cognitive ability to be able to pick that up, especially younger children. Children, you know, five, four, five, six, seven. That's why when you see games that are tailored at young kids, there's a lot of flashing lights, there's a lot of changing screens. It's really about trying to get that reward centre going in their, in their brain. And if you leave them to their own devices, okay, and just here's a screen, go sit in the corner, disappear for an hour and then go and pick them up, without actually being there to kind of help them navigate, talk through that stuff, I think that's where you start to really get that um, reinforcement and entrenchment in the, in the psyche about what that is. And mm -hmm. for us as parents, it's been very easy during this time. I've got to get work done. I'm working at home. Here's an iPad. Go sit in the corner, disappear there for an hour and a half so I can do some paperwork working from home. Fixed. And that's what <laughs> seems to kind of drive that, you know, addiction to that particular um, game or thing that they're, they're doing. And I think that's where the challenge lies for us as parents is how we navigate that. And that's what I guess I'm, I'm about here in, in helping people do that. So, so addressing, I guess, the elephant in the room, that is the dopamine that gaming um, addiction gives kids. Um, how can parents, when, when they want to sort of maybe wean their, their, their children out of, I guess, um, sort of playing um, the gaming so much and being so addicted, how can parents best manage this? Do you have any tips at all? Slowly. Okay, that's the first thing, slowly. So doing things like, um, and I, it's, I'm, I'm just working on a blog about this at the moment, but doing things like unplugging the system or turning off the router or just screaming at them to turn the game off, that's not going to help in a, really. It's going to kind of create an element of resentment and I don't think that that's the, the best way of going it. I think you actually have to look at this as, uh, and again, addiction's a strong word, gaming dependency, but it, it, you've got to do it slowly. It's not cold turkey. You know, we talk about this in you know, cutting the time back. So if, if your child's been allowed to play an hour and a half of gaming every day, you can't go from an hour and a half to, to zero. I think, you know, it's bringing it back. Can we do an hour 15? Can we get from an hour 15 back down to an hour? Can we go from an hour to 45 <clears> minutes? I think if you're in there playing with them, because it breaks it up. You're having a conversation with them. It's not just blinkers on, I'm playing the game. And it's me and the screen and my online friends. If mum or dad is sitting next to me when we're playing, then we're having a conversation about it. Then we go and you're back a big advocate a for that. That's what you advocate. Is, is, Massive. Is, I, I yes. can't stress enough how important that is because you're breaking the game up. They're not just playing on the screen. So in between, they're not looking at the lobby or going through whatever. That You guys are having a conversation, debriefing about the game, what worked, what didn't, and you're starting to have a dialogue and you're now lessening the hold of the game, but more it's more about you and your child and the game rather than just your child and the game. And again, if I just use pokies for an example, you know, those people that go to the pokies sit there by themselves just pulling the yanking on the machine as opposed to those 
social outings where you get a group of people to go to the pokies, they might play for half an hour. You wouldn't call those people addicted. They like their hour a week at the pokies on pension day or whatever it might be. They do that, but they go as a group and they disappear as opposed to the person who's in there every day on the slots by themselves. So I think, you know, slowly being patient, understanding that this is something that may have been quite big or something quite, you know, I said almost addictive. And you've got to bring them out of that slowly. And I think you want to be part of the solution and top down at them, I don't think is the way to go. Um, I mm -hmm. know with my daughter, we, we sit down, we'll do stuff together, we'll transition out. And for my son, especially going back to school and sport, he found it difficult. And so having conversations and playing with him and helping him transition away was the way we, we worked him through that kind okay. of phase. And I mean, lucky enough that we are in South Australia, we're kind of working through that, but I, I definitely know that at other states that's going to be a, a challenge moving, moving forward as you kind of go back in to then come back out again. So so, yeah. so what I'm hearing is that parents shouldn't, should really manage their expectations and understanding that, that it's not going to happen straight away, that they should maybe have a, a month or give themselves three three weeks or a time frame to be able to ease their, ch their child out of the amount of time that they are actually playing. Um, and, and, and be realistic about it, but also empathetic to the child um, as well. Would you say, have I heard that right? Definitely. I think people have to understand that, you know, in our, in our vernacular, it's just a game, right? I, it's just a game, just turn it off, right? But these kids have over two, three weeks, four weeks of isolation have developed some real friendships. If they've streamed or online, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's an understanding that you're going to be online, so there's a commitment made. Um, they may have put a lot of work and effort into it. And is that no different than doing some cross stitch or working on a hobby of your own that you put a lot of time and effort into and you're now proud of? That's what kids have been doing. That's the, that's the work that they've been putting in. So we're now, obviously we have to transition them away because they can't, you know, we want to kind of get them into the normality of what life is. Mm. But yes, I agree. It's got to be slow and gradual, like with everything. Like give yourself a time frame <laughs> and, you know, understand that there's going to be tantrum. Don't take them personally. They're not at you. They're just getting frustrated with the situation and they may be moving away from something that they really, really enjoy and love. But yeah, just be with them, hold their hand, talk to them, be patient, give yourself the time and your child the time to transition out. And I think the, the process will become a lot, be a lot less painful um, than just kind of, you know, tearing your hair out, screaming, wanting them to turn off and just- Not going to happen. To the way yeah. That, yeah. Manage your expectations and be empathetic. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I mean, a lot of, games are also highly adrenalized and a lot of parents notice that when their kids finish playing that they are just really exhausted um so in your view how can parents best manage this issue i guess oh, look that's a tough one because you know again it goes into that whole dopamine driven type of adrenalized it's exciting they keep it you know, I, look game developers have even shown that early on they make the game a little bit easier for a person so they'd have a good positive experience so that they'll continue to play the game before they actually make it more difficult. So there is that notion of keeping you always on the edge of your seat so that you'll keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's, look, that is a challenge. I mean, even as adults, we can kind of find out, I'll just get to the next spot, I'll just get to the next spot. That is, that is, a, real, that is a real challenge. Um, I think the big thing here is, here is regular breaks whilst playing. Okay, so it's not a case of three hour block and then we switch off. For me, the, 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 the kicker there is regular breaks. So, you know, and this is where you need to understand the game they're playing. But, you know, you might say, look, the child might have three hours on the game, but if that three hours is done over the course of a day rather than three hour block, I think you're going to have less of those issues around that. Exhaustion and tiredness. Type, yep. You know, because they're actually going away, you know, they've played, they've played half an hour, an hour, and they've disappeared, they've gone and done something else for an hour or two, knowing that they can go back to it. So there's not so much of an issue getting them off in the first place, but you've allowed the levels to come back up, they go back in, it comes up, and then it drops back down again, rather than kind of being on this exponential constant. Where just keeps yeah. Where they just more in a heap. Yes. Um, and I think that, that's like anything, just break it up, give them time away, say, look, you can have half an hour now, but at the end, and, and pre-worn, so say, look, you've got half an hour on, but then in half an hour... You're you going to have a break. Going to, you're, going to go out, you're going to go walk the dog. Yep. Or going to go read a book. Or we're going to play a board game or, or Get some whatever. fresh air. Or, think, yep. yeah, just do it early. Get out in front of it. Don't say, okay, you've been on it for an hour. Now we're going to go and do this. Because they're right in the throes of like, yeah. Yep. 
yeah, they're, more, they're right in it. They're like, oh, and then it's like, then I'll get angry with you and I'll snap at you and it's not personal, but it's because of their minds in here. And so the parent is best that. before they, they switch it on, before they start to be able to, to set the expectations then. So in an hour or in half an hour, you are going to have a break for this reason. So for example, in our family, let's use our family as an example, our kids have to earn 50 points before they can actually start playing. So points are given to things like unloading the dishwasher, vacuuming the floor. Oh, I love so this. Chores, walking the dog, um, you know, helping with lunch, whatever it might be, they get points and you can nominate those points. Once they've reached the 50 points, then they win a certain amount of gaming and then they can go and do that and then come back out and do something else. And we can negotiate. So, I you see, know, Luca awesome. might have a... Yeah, so Master 13 might, like, look, my son Luke might have a, a stream on that he's going to have people watching him, so he has to be on there, and it might be a two-hour stream. So we say, okay, we've got your two hours, but now we're bargaining. Now we're having a negotiation. So if we're having a two-hour block, tomorrow you're going to have to win 80 points before you can get back on. So there is a... You're talking in their language of, to them uh, as well. Like you're an adult. Right? You're like, I mean, I know they are children, but if you, if you come at them at the same level and understand that there is a, a reward component to this, that it's not a right, but it's a reward, and you can work with them to do that. And look, my wife came together with that point system. I said it was a great idea. She's worked out the, the nuances. She's the dot the I's, cross the T's type person in our relationship. Um, <laughs> but it, it works. But it works. Well. And I, I think really that does. system could really work for, for parents that just don't know where to start and they just can't necessarily pull their kids out of just their eyes being glued on that screen and all of that dopamine fix and, and everything that comes along with it. Setting up some form of a, a, um, a point system can help sort of rip the child out of that and understanding that, you know what, you had a life before you got into all of this and now you just need to be able to, we're not asking you to completely stop, but we just need you to integrate a little bit of what you had before into what you're doing now. And, um, you know, I think having that is, is, is really, really important. And I think that that's an awesome, awesome idea. So thank you for sharing that with us as well. That's great. Absolutely. 20 points to you. So there you go. Oh, I'll, just, I'll give you 100 oh, points. Yeah, for that, I got 15 minutes, minutes gaming tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want with those points, but, you know, I've just given them to you. <laughs> now, also, and you mentioned before, there's an expectation that kids um, have to be available and um, online on a regular basis. And this can put a lot of pressure on kids because of course in their social network, they're dealing with kids that may be a little bit more addicted than they are, or maybe more committed and or what have you. They don't know what is happening in that other household, but you know, kids in their social network now are going to be sort of, I've heard stories as early as, you know, 7.30 in the morning, other kids at the moment are just like, come on, come on, where are you? And, and they're getting that pressure and the tings are coming through their phone and the prompts and, and, and this can also cause an underlying sense of anxiety in children also that they have to be uh, available. So, you know, in your view, how can parents help to overcome this given that they are not only just dealing with their kids, but also the children that they're actually affiliated with in those social circles that they've built that relationship. It's a real challenge. That, look, it's a real challenge. It's no different than peer pressure in real life. Like, I mean, this is this is the this is the this is the whole thing. And uh, I mean, parenting advice and and you know, I think like dealing with your offline peers, online peers, it's the same. It's the ability to say no. Um, and understanding that, like, I mean, I talk a lot about this through the, the the prism of, you know, streaming in particular, because, you know, if you're looking to build a community and you're looking to take your, and monetize and build a career like my son, is, there is an expectation in order to get followers, it's like watching TV, you know, they've got to, you've got to be there regular time, regular things, so that people, what those popcorn gamers come down and they watch you play, and that's how you build your online following, it's how you build your clout, that's how you build you know, your your reputation and, and people will then keep coming to watch you and it continually grows and builds and so you get subscriptions and that's how you build a, a revenue stream from it. That's one component. But look, my son has, you know, kids that are you know, friends of my daughter who are pinging him at midnight. Where are you? How come you're not online? Jeez pinging the him at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Where are you? Okay. So we've had conversations around notifications off like you know you've got your phone find out a kid's phone's not allowed in their room so that's first one okay so no gaming is done in their room so once the kid's in bed 
there's no bed, no no phones or no electronics in the room. Okay, so that way there's no chance of being interrupted during those those hours. And it's not unusual for my son to go, oh man, I got messaged, you know, 50 times last night by such and such who wanted me to be on at 12:30 or whatever. So I think that's part of it. Um, but my big thing is I don't think it's really any different to um, offline. Okay, and if there's peer pressure offline, there's peer pressure online. The only difference is the accessibility and that becomes a conversation with you as a parent with your child about how they use their technology, be it a, um, a mobile phone, a tablet, a laptop, you know, through Discord server or whatever. And, and I've always tried, I, I, I say that, but I'm not here to pass judgment or kind of, you know, everybody has different interactions with how they manage their children with, with devices. Um, you know, we have a very much policy of you know, no, buy, no devices at the table, no devices in the bedrooms, no devices, you know, if we're gonna use computers or whatever, they're gonna be in common areas, nothing's gonna be done in spaces that we're not aware of it. They're very hard and fast rules and have been put in from the start and both my wife and I have been very consistent around that message. So that's how we handle it in our household. But that's still not to say my son doesn't get asked, where are you, where are you, where are you? Um, I guess we've done a lot of work around him to just say, look, just say no. It's okay to say no. Um, and to this point, we've been fortunate. But I understand that um, that's not as easy for other parents. Um, and I think that's where communication, talking, but not looking at it from a... I think you have to be with them. I don't think you can come at it from a, a negative or from a this is bad. I think you have to try and get into it from the perspective of understanding, you know, why this is happening and then helping your son or daughter negotiate that from their perspective rather than as a parent saying, well, this is just stupid that they're messaging you all the time. It's just a game. It's not important. You know, just tell them no, shut up. You know, da, da. I think that's just trivializing it. And I don't think that's going to have the effect that you want. And we'll just kind of set you guys up to have loggerheads and, and kind of butt heads. So my advice would be to kind of ask why, have a real conversation and repetitive. You're going to have to repeat yourself a hundred times, but accept that that's the reality. Work with your child through that. And I do think at the end it's of the day, a... over time, you'll, you'll work through it together. And I think that's the kicker together. Don't make it just about them being isolated and having to make this decision themselves because you're right. They might have five, 10, 15 people. My son's got 80 odd followers. There are people out there with hundreds of followers that are, Hey, are you streaming tonight? Are you going to come online? Like, wow. do you want to watch you? You know, that's, that's a big thing. And for them, that community is critically important if yep. they want to build like a, a career or something out of it. So, yeah. yeah. But setting boundaries and um, some rules, I think, in, in the first place will definitely help. And as you said, coming at it from through the eyes of the kids and not actually sort of just then sort of at them as a parent, that's not going to necessarily get the outcome that, you, that you're wanting. But I guess here in Australia also, as you mentioned earlier, um, it, there is a, a very clear disparity between our states and territories and levels of lockdown and active COVID cases that we have, um, of course, with what's happening here in, in Melbourne, Victoria at the moment. But that being said, you know, um, we have a wide contrast in circumstances that parents are currently in. So, you know, we have um, some that are recovering from the intensity of lockdown, like you guys in South Australia, and maybe also the um, the, um, the, you know, our families that are um, sort of part of our community out in Western Australia and some families that have been thrown right back into it, like here in Victoria. So irrespective of, I guess, of the situation parents are finding themselves in, in the context of COVID, at some point, everyone is going to experience the loosening of restrictions where we have, um, you know, to be able to sort of phase our kids out of, you know, sort of this, this, um, this addiction, I guess, and sort of having them return to their um, sort of, you know, prior commitments that we were talking about at the very start, you know, and as you've said before that you're now your, your family, that they're getting back to, to their football training and back to their hobbies and back to school and all of these things. So in your view, do you think children who have become accustomed to playing online more um, during sort of COVID lockdown experience the challenges in returning back to normality a lot harsher um and or i'd just like to know your your thoughts on that that topic in general Look, I, undoubtedly undoubtedly i think it, it goes without saying i said you know it depends on the personality of the child i mean i've got two master 
13 and, and you know, little miss 11, she's gregarious. She loves interaction. She couldn't wait to get back to school. She yeah. couldn't wait to go and see her friends, performing arts, all that kind of stuff. Like she loved socializing on day, but it's not the same as, you know, not, you know, like giving hugs or being in there and having a chat. She's very animated. So for her, the transition was very easy. For my son, you know, he's, he's kind of, I think secretly, if you ask him, he's hoping for a lockdown again so that he can go <laughs> back in and do that stuff. Again, I think that you got two him, extremes. He, he was in his element, so um, and you know he, we've had conversations. This is the kind of stuff we're having conversations about now. About like, for example, next year, he's already contemplating about whether he's going to go back and play soccer next year, because you know that's two, three nights a week where that's a real um, commitment. And is that time for him better served building his online following because that's what he he wants, wants to, to do with so, his career? Yeah. Not, yeah, but see, these are conversations we're having already. But, you know, when you ask why and, and all of that kind of stuff, it's a, it's a slightly different, um, you know, the conversation we're having is a little bit different. But, no, definitely I think, I, again, I go back to that whole thing of coming back from an overseas holiday, okay? They're going to be sluggish. They're going to be slow, getting out of bed in the morning, you know. Um, they, they're going to want to know how their friends are online. So just taking back what you were saying before about the different states. So my son, his online friends, he's got, you know, one of his closest friends is in Queensland. Um, he's got people from Melbourne, from Sydney. Um, so they all come online and play together. Now, you've got kids that are going to stage threes and stage fours in Victoria, as opposed to, as you say, Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, where these kids are going to school. Now, the, the COVID, you know, the kids that are, going into isolation, they're online all the time. So that's their world. And they're going to be pinging the kids that are living their real, you know, the- Getting the, back the to normality. Yep, yep. Getting back to normality. And it's going to create this kind of- Of course it know, is. It's like, hey, man, I've got to go to school. Like, I know you've got all day, but I've got to go to school or I've got to, you know, I've got homework to do or whatever. So there is going to be this extra layer of challenge because we've got these different jurisdictions doing all these different things. So I think- it will be difficult for those kids that are really into gaming to make that transition away. Um, as we said earlier, it's just got to be patience and understanding around that. Um, I, and I said, you just use it. So you coming back from a holiday. They're just not going to be able to flick a switch and come back on. So mm. it will be tougher for them. Um, don't take anything they say personally. It's not aimed at you. They're just frustrated. Okay. Um, and if you're conciliatory with them, look, at man, I get it. Know, like I say, look, I get it. You want to be online, you want to be playing games, but that's not the reality. We can't do that, so we're going to have to balance it out, okay? We're going to have to do a little bit of everything, all right? Not saying not play, transition now, and you know, he's back into it now. He's, he's okay. He's still playing his games. But it, that, those first couple of weeks, you know, it was a bit mush in the mouth. He was a bit, you know, we'd say mush. It's a whole, mm, he, didn't, he wanted to kind of be online because that was where he kind of fit in his mind. Yes. Um, and well, um, so well, that would be... And you speak to people, I guess, um, and streamers all around the world. So what have you actually learned from speaking with other gamers around the world? Has, has this been a, a similar thing? Look, gaming community, you know, look, the, the gaming community is really interesting, okay, because you've got subsets and subcultures within it, depending on, for example, the games they play or the things they do. So in my experience, if you, we take a, a, um, a, a franchise like Call of Duty, which has just dropped its own free one, Warzone, which is like Fortnite for adults, okay, I find that community and that, that Australia, especially in Australia, the service, quite toxic, quite nasty. I don't, I'm not, it's not something that I'm, I'm really... A fan of and I definitely wouldn't recommend children playing in that space I mean apart from the games not rated for them but you will have communities like Animal Crossing where the communities are very supportive they're very caring they're very because the type of the game they play so I think it depends on the and this is like I go back to saying understanding the game that they're playing and the community that they're playing is that some communities online are very supportive um, and generally, gaming community as a whole is very supportive, which is why people find a, a, a place there, um, you know, a place where they connect with people that they potentially don't connect with outside of that. But they are a very supportive community. Um, 
but yeah, like, you know, the, the joke is gamers have been preparing for isolation for their whole lives. Okay? <laughs> they, 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 for them, it was like you know, the only thing they were missing was the zombie apocalypse. Like that was the joke that went around in, in gaming communities. Like the only thing that's missing from this is the zombies because yes. a lot of the games you play involve zombies and that kind of thing. So <laughs> for a lot of people coming back to normality for gaming was diff- difficult from adults right through to children. I know we talk a lot about children because that's the scope of what we're looking at, but Um, You know, I say to my wife, I need a month off so I can go back and knock off all the things that I kind of started during the the slowdown that that COVID provided. So, um, yeah, look, in those gaming communities, um, you saw people actually leave their jobs to focus 100% on gaming. Get out of town. Really? I'm getting straight into this. This is my passion. This is my love. This is what I'm going to do. I have thrown the whole everything into that. Um, you've got people struggling um, around integrating back into to real life. You know, you term real life, but integrating into that, going to work every day and doing that stuff, definitely. But for the most part, I think we all knew this was going to come. The day that COVID, you know, for example, in South Australia, we all knew that there was going to come a time where we we're going to have to return back to the real world and, and normality. And I think that, you know, we've maintained that link. We've fostered and created stronger relationships with friendships online and that's not a bad thing. I don't want people to see it as a negative. I think, you know, as I said, the gaming community is very supportive. The friends that you make online are very supportive. It's amazing what you will talk to about with people online that you won't talk to people face to face. So they may have opened up and shared things to people online that they may not have done. It's a safer space. Um, so we've got to see it. We've got to take the good with the bad. It's not all bad. It's not all, you know, it's, it's, it's virtual world where nothing really exists and it's all just you know uh, it's, it's very real it's actually, a lot of it's real and there is a lot of evidence now showing that those online relationships are just as important and just as relevant as um as those um you know face-to-face relationships sure. i often joke it's amazing how we romanticize the pen and paper and the old pen power that we used to send stuff yeah. to and you know we've that were created and they're lovely but somehow friendships we've cultivated online playing games or through message groups or chat groups are bad we're demonizing the media where the underlying thing is still the same which is interaction with people we don't know but we form these friendships and relationships and i think in a world where we sometimes become more isolated i think you know in some ways that's a beautiful thing having groups of people that we can actually talk to debrief to and, and actually it's people who share our interests and, and we feel safe enough in that space to be who we are. Um, I think yes. that's not necessarily. Well, I just wanted to reference the quote that you've um, mentioned a few times. I just wanted to read it out. So um, our listeners and watchers can actually sort of hear the whole thing, but in quoting you, the ending of restrictions for gaming kids is like um, returning from a relaxing tropical holiday we know what we have to do but we'd rather be back on that tropical island so there you go there's a full quote now so in summary we, we've sort of touched on a lot of key subjects but how would you i guess summarize your key messages for any parent watching or listening okay i think the big thing is um I, as i say anybody who reads my stuff will know i think it's really important as parents to understand where your child is coming from Okay, and with a game of child, and I'm going to pull it back, with a game of child, the easiest way to do that is to actually play with them. Okay, Um, if you're playing with them, you can have conversations about it. That will start the understanding process of where they're coming from. Not only that, they will open up to you, see that you're taking them seriously. And then from there, just be patient. Okay, work with them. Um, Understand that they're not being pains in the bum just for the sake of being pains in the bum. They are actually going through some form of withdrawal. Okay, and that that's going to take time for that to do that. So strategies that you can use as far as whittling the time back slowly, not just kind of pulling it on, just like just pulling it off and saying, yes, we're finishing now. I think it's just coming from that place of understanding and knowing that your kids do know at the heart of hearts that they have to get back into this. They're just dragging their feet on it. No different than getting out of bed and going to school in the morning. You just got to be patient. Keep repeating the same message. Come from a place of, love and patience and understanding and i think you will get far more from that than yelling and screaming and um, you know i get it we get frustrated but we're the adults they're the kids we're the ones that have to learn to kind of control our emotions and um and help them transition that's that would be the big thrust of what i'm trying to say awesome um, and if 
and if I and if you do think your child is addicted, okay, and that does happen, I I'm going to advocate. Think you really should get it checked and seen, and and um, you know get some professional help around that. And who would they speak to? Uh, look, doctors first, and maybe look at the mental health um, expert or something like that. Okay. Great advice. And this has been an awesome chat. If parents have got any other questions for you and want to reach out, whereabouts can they find you? Um, look, social media is the best. So Dad the Gamer, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, just sing out, let me know, and we'll, um, I'm more than happy to in, in, in get involved. Twitter as well. I'm on all of them. So that's the best place to go. Awesome. AC, this has been awesome. <laughs> and really look forward to, to speaking with you again. Take care and stay safe. See you later. Thanks, Rachel. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.